it's good to have everybody here this morning with us in this way. Um, you know, we keep seeing signs that maybe it won't be too long before we can finally be back together as a church family in the sanctuary. Um, but that's still probably going to be months away before that is viable without um, having to issue numbers for people to choose to see how many of you could come to a service, which I would never want to do. I think in a lot of ways, this feels a lot more connectional than if we only had 20 people in the sanctuary. So I'm just so thankful that we have technology in this way and are able to gather together. Um, for those of you who have been without power for several days, um, you know, the Arias house was destroyed. The Falcons had a tree come through one of their rooms. Um, we're just so grateful that you are all healthy, that you're all well and safe. Um, but our prayers are certainly with you as you have to go through this, um, this rebuilding and, um, and relocation of your families um, at a time like this. It's just uh, one thing more that I know must be so difficult to go through. We also keep Kevin Bechtold in our prayers at two o'clock this afternoon. He's having surgery. So just please keep him in your prayers today at two o'clock and uh, that he would come through that surgery well and uh, would be healed again and, and made whole. Well, the peace of our Lord Christ be with you all and also with you.
Let us join together in our call to worship. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things God has done for us? We will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who find their refuge in God. Come, let us worship God together. grace from the beginning of time you were there forming and shaping the heavens and the earth all that you created was done out of love for us and a desire to be in relationship with us we give you thanks O god for your gift of life and for your love made flesh in jesus christ we turn to you now in worship and lift up our hearts in adoration and praise in jesus name amen the Spirit of God intercedes for us and helps us in our weakness. So let us turn to God in silent prayer and then join together in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning. So a lot of people who are married wear wedding rings. And they do this because it's a symbol of the promise they made to each other on their wedding day. They promise to love each other through the good and the bad for the rest of their lives. You know, we've all made promises before. And you know who else does? God. God made a promise to a man named Noah, and he makes promises to us too. You see, we all know the story of Noah. God sent a flood to the earth because people weren't listening to him and he made it way he made a way for Noah to build an ark and save his family. And at the end of it, he made a promise to Noah and he gave a symbol of the rainbow that he would never do that again. And I find God's promises reassuring because when God says he's going to do something, he does it. We can look all throughout scripture and see the promises that he's made to us. And so in the coming days, in the good and the bad, I hope you find encouragement and hope in God's promises because he loves us, he cares for us, and he will take care of us. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for your promises. Help us to find our hope in you. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, and it covers sections from chapter 6 through chapter 9. So listen to the story of Noah and the ark. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in the ark, cover it with and out with inside and out with pitch. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh, and which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. The rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah with his sons Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of their sons entered the ark. They and every wild animal of every kind, and all domestic animals of every kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every bird of every kind, every bird, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth and the waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The water swelled and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all human beings, everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died and the water swelled on the earth for 150 days. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw that the face of the ground was drying. 
In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took up every clean animal of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. God said, this is the sign of the covenant I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we're going to begin a summer sermon series on the unlikely heroes of our faith. And it occurs to me that as I've thought about all of the heroes and heroines that are in scripture, that not a single one of them wanted to be a hero. None of them wanted to do what God called them to do, whether it was to take them to a new land or to be living or worshiping God in a new way or to even to lead them into battle. None of them wanted to do that. They only did it because they were faithful to God and they were intent on following God no matter what. Every one of them would have backed out in a heartbeat, including Noah, whose story is told in the fifth through ninth chapters of Genesis. And here is again how we're introduced to him. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil. And the Lord was sorry he had made humankind, and it grieved him to his heart. In other words, God decided to call a halt to civilization. It was time to start something new. For whatever reason, God saw no other option than to begin all over again. And that's exactly what God did. There was only one human being on earth God thought was worth saving, and that was Noah. So God saved Noah and his family in the hope that this time he'd get it right. Well, Noah's Ark isn't the only flood story that's in antiquity, and there are hundreds of others literally, and many of them tell the story very similarly to the way the story of Noah is told. There's a man who is chosen and then that person builds a boat and takes their family on board and the flood washes everything away and it's birds that are sent out to mark the receding waters and sacrifices are offered as the family disembarks from the boat. But there's one significant difference between this story of Noah and his ark and all of these other stories that exist about a man being saved to build his ark. And that is that in these other stories, there are bickering gods who decide that they just don't want to deal with humankind any longer and their unruly behavior. And so they get fed up and they unleash their wrath. But the God in this story of Noah's Ark isn't an irritated neighbor. This God is more like a troubled parent because God is ripped apart by grief over how humanity has turned out, how they've fallen away from God and become angry and rebellious and violent. And God doesn't know what else to do other than to begin again. And after he does, 
God is immediately filled with regret. Long before Jesus came to earth to show us what God is like, this story of Noah gives us a glimpse into the character and nature of God as our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Until now, God's remained somewhat aloof, casting Adam and Eve out from the garden, passing judgment on Cain for killing his brother Abel. But here, we begin to see God begin to, to demonstrate compassion and love for God's creation. And we see that God has feelings, deep feelings for his creation. And Noah is singled out to be in a close relationship with God and model for the generations to come what faithfulness looks like. When it's all over, God says to Noah, never again shall all flesh be cut off from the waters of the flood. And when the bow is in the clouds, I'll see it. And I'll remember the covenant that I made with you and with all future generations. In other words, from now on, I'm in the protection business, for your lives are as important to me as my very own. So why this change of heart? Where just 40 days before, God was ready to wipe out all of humanity. Had the world really changed that quickly? Of course not, because we see, if you continue to read the story, that in no time at all, Noah curses his grandson. Jacob will steal his brother's birthright. Aaron will worship a golden calf. David will have a man killed in order to cover up his affair with Bathsheba. Humanity hasn't changed, and humanity never will change, but God does. From this point forward, every time we see God's faithful turning away from God, no longer does God strike them down, but God goes after them. God goes after the one sheep who strayed from the 99 others in order to bring them back into the fold again. And God redeems those who repent, gives them a ring, a robe, a feast to welcome them back home after they've sought forgiveness. And God sends his spirit to guide us if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. There's a wonderful story about Condoleezza Rice, who was the former Secretary of State under George W. Bush. She's a concert pianist. She's an accomplished ice skater and golfer. She's a professor at Stanford University, has authored several books, a brilliant woman who has achieved more than most of us can begin to imagine. She's also a member of a Presbyterian church, but she didn't always grow up as a faithful Christian. She grew up in segregated Georgia as an only child and remembers not being allowed to drink at a soda fountain that was reserved for whites. But her parents told her she could accomplish anything she set her mind to do, and she believed them. At the age of three, she told her parents she wanted a piano. And they said to her that they would arrange to get a piano for her if she learned to play it first. Well, her maternal grandmother happened to be a piano teacher. And so she went to her grandmother and asked her to teach her to play piano. And she taught her to play the song, Jesus Loves Me. And she said she did that because she and her grandfather were people of faith and like her parents wanted her to grow up with a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. She said that night after I spent eight hours learning Jesus Loves Me, I played it for my parents. And in response, they rented a piano for me and I practiced. Whatever it was I wanted to do, whether it was ice skating or learn violin or flute or take French lessons or dance or ballet, they provided the money, the time, the effort needed and often went without themselves in order to give me what I needed to succeed. Well, when I was 15, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and my faith went into a tailspin. She said she was treated and lived for another 15 years, but at that point, Condoleezza Rice decided to take her future into her own hands. 
By the age of 26, she was an assistant professor at Stanford. She was an expert in Soviet politics. She traveled internationally more often than she was in the United States. Too busy to go to church. She found her faith fading into the background of her life. But she said one Sunday morning, she happened to be in the grocery store and she was approached by someone who recognized her and said to her, Condoleezza, don't you play the piano? And she said, well, yes, I do. And she said, well, our pianist in church got sick and she's not able to play this morning. Would you come to our church and would you play for us for the service? And she did. And that divine appointment got her back to attending church regularly. Condoleezza said she thought to herself, my goodness, God has a long reach. I mean, in the supermarket of all places. And as a result of going and playing the piano and getting involved again with a church community, she said, I began to see how much of my faith I was taking for granted. It was a turning point in her life. She renewed her faith and her relationship with God and her desire to make a difference, not just for herself, but for God and for other people. If we were to summarize this story of God's people that we see in scripture, it's this. When things go well, we tend to turn away from God. We forget about God. We take life and faith for granted. But thankfully, God has a long reach. And it's that reach that we see emerge in the clouds in the form of a rainbow. And that rainbow is a reminder to us that God reaches out to us even when we don't reciprocate. That God is a covenant partner with us, that we are co-creators, redeemers, and sustainers of this earth that we have been charged to nurture and protect as long as there is life within us. It's a reminder that God is still in charge and that Christ is still our anchor. And we have nothing to fear as long as we keep God at the center of everything we do. It's a reminder that the story of Noah isn't over yet. Because we all know it's still raining. As we watch the floodwaters of violence and anger and hatred rise, we know that we still haven't gotten the message that God wanted the people of Israel to understand that we are all created in God's image and that any way we mar the image of God or one another, we grieve God. In fact, God's worst grief came not on that day when the heavens broke loose and all but Noah and his family were swept away, but on that dark afternoon when God watched as those he hoped were faithful turned their backs on his only son. And yet it was love that propelled him to send his son in the first place. Love for us, his creation, as ignorant and destructive as we may be at times. So this story about Noah and his ark has everything to do with us. In a very real way, I think the church has become the ark now bobbing around on rough seas. And if anybody ever asks you, do you think the story of Noah and his ark ever really happened? Tell them it's still happening everywhere we look. It's just that most days it's easy to ignore the signs of the rising water all around us. You know the signs, ignorance, hatred, violence, selfishness, bitterness, blindness, amnesia, forgetting who we are and whose we are and who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. And we start thinking the world owes us rather than we owe God. But God has made a promise to Noah and to each of us that even when we break our promise to God, when I bring the clouds, God says, um, and I see that bow in the clouds, I will remember 
the everlasting covenant that I made with you, which means that God chose to be for us, to live for us, die for us, rise again for us. And if we can ever, in the depths of our souls, begin to comprehend just what that means, then we can begin to make strides towards becoming more faithful witnesses of the gospel in a world gone awry. And the rainbow will appear again and remind us that even one person can make a difference because God is with us and God isn't going anywhere. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. And now let us affirm our faith using the words from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
The invitation to the Lord's Supper is offered to everyone who has been baptized. All that is required is a penitent heart and a willing spirit. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So now hear the words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they have been delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. He writes, I have received of the Lord that which I have also given to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said to his disciples, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, Jesus took the cup when he had supped. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. And so as our Lord Jesus on the same night he was betrayed took these elements so I take them to set them apart from their common use to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed them, let us now draw near to God in prayer and thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. For you are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. In humility, he came to us and knelt in obedience to love's commands. And in freedom, he has now taken our place in death so that we might have eternal life with him in his kingdom. In the deserts of our wanderings, he sustains us, giving us his body as manna for our weariness. And the cup of suffering he drank has become for us the cup of salvation. In his death, he ransomed us from death's dominion. In his resurrection, he opened the way to eternal life. So remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you've given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. And we humbly ask you, O merciful God, to keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, world without end. And now as our Savior taught us to pray, we join to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us share these gifts with one another at Christ's table. This is the body of Christ broken for you.
and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. The bread we break and the cup that we take is it not sharing in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And so we are. So let us join together in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that you have nurtured us at the table of your son, Jesus Christ. You have placed your life into our hands. Now we place our lives into yours. Take us, renew and remake us, and dismiss us in peace, for our eyes have now seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. May we be your living presence in this world and in the world to come. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and in God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessings of God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <coughs> to unmute you all, which I have now done. And I just want to thank the choir and Ting Ting and Jerry for participating in the music this morning. It was absolutely beautiful. And if you didn't notice, there are flowers behind me. And those were given by Elizabeth and Paul Sperry in honor of their parents, uh, Sarah and Ken. So every year they dedicate flowers to the church in order to remember their parents and lift them up. They were very faithful members of Newtown Square Presbyterian Church. And so I got to enjoy them in my home, <laughs> in addition to having them for our worship service this morning. <laughs> 